Hi. Today's session will highlight some key principles in the assessment of a patient in shock. We'll define and discuss the different types of shock states, focusing on the changes in physiology that are observed in each type of shock. It's important to start thinking about which physiologic changes are due to the pathologic condition that has caused the shock and which are a result of the body's attempts to compensate to maintain perfusion to the body's most vital organs. This will be discussed in greater detail during your simulation sessions. To be able to manage shock appropriately, a clinician must first be able to recognize the condition. Then, considering the concepts of physiology that you have learned, the clinician must discern the type of shock in order to resuscitate the patient appropriately. Let's see how this clinical scenario might look. Doc, this is Mr. Stevens. We uh, just brought him in from home. Uh, his wife called the ambulance. He was having a lot of chest pain. Said he was really weak, having a hard time getting out of bed. Uh, we checked his vital signs. His heart rate was about 115 or so, and his blood pressure was in the 70s. Yeah, he was kind of sick. I'm not sure what's going on with him, but we tried to get him here as fast as we could. Awesome. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, I'm Dr. Hine. I'm taking care of you today, okay? Hi, Mr. Stevens. My name is Lindsay. I'm going to be your nurse today. I'm going to get an IV in you, get you on the monitor, and get some vital signs, okay? Okay. All right, so, sir, what brings you into the ER today? Uh, I was having this horrible heartburn for the past couple of days. My chest was really killing me, and uh, today I was so weak. I mean, I couldn't even I couldn't even get out of bed. I was so short of breath and just feeling weak all over. Okay. Well, we're gonna figure out what's going on. Okay. Review this triage assessment with particular attention to the vital signs. in shock. He's tachycardic and hypotensive, and he's been acting kind of confused, which suggests he's not perfusing his brain well. Uh, I really like bananas. I agree. I think we need to figure out what kind of shock we're dealing with here. Can you grab some blood for the lab and call for an EKG and a chest x-ray? Right away, Doc. Shock is a state in which oxygen demand of tissues exceeds oxygen delivery to tissues. This is a state of tissue hypoperfusion. There are several key concepts in physiology that are essential to understanding shock. These include cardiac output, which you will remember is heart rate times the stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, which is largely determined by the degree of vasoconstriction or vasodilation of the body's blood vessels and inotropy, or the contractility of the heart. A few other concepts that we will include in our discussion are preload, mean arterial pressure, and tissue perfusion. If any of these concepts is foreign to you, now is the time to pause and review these. The rest of the session assumes an understanding of these concepts. There are different categories of shock. It is important to discern which type of shock is present, as the treatment will depend on what has caused the shock state. Let's look individually at each of the types of shock as we go through our case. The first type of shock we'll discuss is hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock may result from severe dehydration in a patient with diarrhea, vomiting, and poor fluid intake. But more commonly, this type of shock results from acute blood loss. For instance, in the setting of a traumatic injury or a rapid gastrointestinal hemorrhage. It is important to remember that the blood loss may be external or internal. When the cause is bleeding, it is termed hemorrhagic shock. In hemorrhagic shock, cardiac output is low because of low preload. In an attempt to compensate and maintain cardiac output, the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac contractility. Well, is it hemorrhagic shock? Are there any signs of Bleeding? I don't think so. It doesn't seem like he's been in a car accident. There's no history of assault. I don't think it's hemorrhagic shock we're dealing with here. What else should we consider? The next type of shock we'll consider is distributive shock. This occurs when there is a drop in systemic vascular resistance. This means that the peripheral arteries dilate, mean arterial pressure drops, and the perfusion of tissues therefore decreases. This happens for three main reasons. 
The first is anaphylaxis. In anaphylactic shock, there is an immune-mediated drop in systemic vascular resistance. The second cause of distributive shock is sepsis. In septic shock, an infection triggers an exaggerated systemic inflammatory response. Cytokines and interleukins interact to decrease systemic vascular resistance. The third cause of distributive shock is neurogenic. This occurs when there is a spinal cord injury, typically above the T5 level, that severs sympathetic nerves and results in a loss of systemic vascular resistance. In anaphylactic and septic shock, the body compensates for a drop in systemic vascular resistance by increasing heart rate and inotropy. However, in neurogenic shock, the patient is unable to compensate due to loss of sympathetic function. Therefore, patients in neurogenic shock have an unusual combination of hypotension and bradycardia. Well, do we have anything to suggest distributive shock? He has no history of ingesting an allergen. He hasn't have been having any wheezing, nausea, vomiting, or skin rash. So I don't think that this is anaphylactic shock. We could probably cross that off the list. I agree. He's not febrile, and he doesn't have any infectious symptoms, like a cough, diarrhea, or urinary complaints. So I don't think this is septic shock either. And he's moving all of his extremities. He has no signs or symptoms of trauma to his spine. And he's not bradycardic. So I don't think that this is neurogenic shock either. What else should we consider? The final category of shock that we will discuss is cardiogenic shock. This is sometimes discussed as a pump failure. The reason may be intrinsic, meaning a problem within the heart itself, or extrinsic, such as fluid pressing on the heart and keeping it from filling. Either way, the primary physiologic problem here is a drop in the cardiac output. The body may attempt to compensate by increasing heart rate and systemic vascular resistance. Mr. Stevens, you said you were having chest pain. You do have coronary artery disease, which puts you at risk for heart attacks. I definitely want to see that EKG and chest x-ray, and we should probably consider getting an echocardiogram and talking to the cardiologist about it. He did say that he took aspirin before he came here, so we don't have to give him that. But we should probably administer some nitroglycerin. We will talk more about the causes of shock in your small group sessions, and we will review the relevant pathophysiology. You will learn that deciding on the appropriate treatment requires an understanding of the patient's physiology. In summary, there are three broad categories of shock, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic, distributive, and cardiogenic. In the simulation session, and in the cases that follow, Challenge yourself to decide what are the primary and compensatory changes in cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, and inotropy for each patient. See you soon.